By the 9th of September, 1939, Poland's situation was dire. The Germans had made rapid progress, despite tenacious resistance, and were closing in on Warsaw. Moreover, Poland's primary ally, France, had yet to launch a major offensive on Germany's western flank. All the while, heavy Luftwaffe raids continued, almost unabated. However, even after more than a week of hard fighting, which saw Polish forces pushed back in disarray, there was one Polish army, still mostly unengaged. This was Army Poznan, under General Tadeusz Kutuzeba. The general had previously asked for permission to launch a counteroffensive, but Marshal Ridge Migwe had refused him, not wanting his army to take unnecessary casualties so early on in the war. Now such plans no longer mattered, though, as something desperately needed to be done to halt the rapidly advancing Germans. Kutuzeba was finally given permission to launch his attack, with the hope that it could take pressure off of Warsaw and enable the retreat of armies Pomerza and Poznan. The plan was to strike against German 8th Army's exposed flank near the Bezira River. This force, commanded by General Johannes Blaskowitz, was arguably the weakest German field army, as it had few armored or mechanized contingents, and consisted primarily of foot infantry, giving it little tactical advantage compared to the Poles they faced. Furthermore, the fact that the Germans failed to account for an intact Polish field army on their northern wing was undoubtedly a major miscalculation, as they likely assumed that their opponents would be unable to do anything other than continue retreating. Kutuzeba attacked in the 9th, spearheaded by three infantry divisions and two cavalry brigades, supported by tankettes and armored cars. The Germans were initially caught unprepared against the Polish onslaught. Blaskowitz's forces got the worst of heavy combat, suffering heavy losses at places, and being forced to fall back with one of their infantry divisions badly mauled. This was a reversal of the previous day's fighting, and it was now the Germans' turn to be overwhelmed and retreat in the face of an advancing enemy. This Polish counterattack came as a nasty shock for the Germans, who did not suspect that their seemingly routed opponents would be capable of such an offensive. However, though the Poles had achieved initial surprise, there was a limit to how much their attack could accomplish. Despite having successes at first, they were mostly in foot and exhausted by days of marching and fighting. Within a few days, the Polish offensive was running out of steam. Though somewhat confused at first, the Germans were able to shift enough soldiers in order to gain numerical superiority in the area. It was planned to trap the Polish units in a pocket and destroy them. German formations moved in and Kutuzeba's forces from all sides, with panzer divisions being withdrawn from the outskirts of Warsaw to block the Polish retreat. By now, any serious chance of continuing the offensive was gone, but fighting was still fierce as German attacks encountered tenacious Polish resistance. There were further Polish efforts to break out, but the two Polish armies involved in the action were now encircled and mercilessly pulverized by German artillery and bombers as they desperately struggled against destruction. Despite the ultimate failure of this counteroffensive, it had briefly caught the Germans off guard and tied down some of their units which gave Polish forces defending Warsaw precious breathing time. Indeed, though eventually being surrounded, many Polish soldiers involved in the Bezira battle were able to slip through German lines and make it to Warsaw. In recognition of the precariousness of the situation, Ridge Migwe ordered Polish soldiers to retreat into the southeastern portion of the country, near the border with Romania, the so-called Romanian bridgehead, in order to regroup. It was hoped that this could serve as a base to counterattack from once the French had started their own offensive. However, even as all this was happening, the vice had continued to squeeze around Poland. Army Group North had continued its attack against Special Operations Group Nerev, 
Despite determined Polish resistance at places such as Vizna, where the Poles initially held back German crossings, German units were able to push across the Nerev and Bug rivers, and by the 14th of September, Operations Group Nerev had been largely destroyed. This allowed German forces, spearheaded by Guderian's motorized and armored units, to start driving down the east bank of the Vistola and flood into eastern Poland. Warsaw was now in danger of envelopment, and Brest, which had been the site of Polish Marshal Edward Rydschmigwe's headquarters, came under attack. Meanwhile, advancing German divisions of the 14th Army were overrunning much of southern Poland, and Polish forces in the south continued to be encircled. With the breakthrough in the north, the Germans closed in on Warsaw again, and were now able to outflank the city from the east, initiating a loose blockade. The noose was being tightened, but many Polish soldiers who had escaped from the Bizarre Pocket were still able to enter the city, and German attacks on Warsaw ran into stiff resistance. Likewise, to the immediate north, Polish soldiers were garrisoning the fortified area around Modlin in preparation for the imminent German assault against the vicinity of the capital. On the 16th, the Germans demanded that Warsaw surrender but were adamantly refused. The Poles were determined to defend the capital. Meanwhile, many Polish units had continued to fall back to the Romanian bridgehead to form a bastion of continued resistance. However, an event was about to unfold which would change the entire nature of the campaign and even the course of 20th century history. As Polish units desperately fought, falling back in face of the German attack, something completely unexpected happened. In the east of the country, Soviet soldiers began pouring over the border, numbering nearly half a million men, with thousands of tanks, other vehicles, and aircraft. The situation was incredibly confused, and at first, there was even some optimistic thought that the Soviet Union had intervened in their side against the Germans. Indeed, some Poles actually welcomed the advancing Soviet soldiers, thinking they would be the saviors of the country. But these hopes were soon dashed when Red Army troops opened fire. At this point, the official claim from Moscow was that this action had been done to protect ethnic minority Belarusian and Ukrainian populations in Poland. They claimed that the Polish government had collapsed and thus ceased to exist as a legitimate state. In reality, this was in fact a secret provision of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in which Poland was to be partitioned by its two much greater neighbors. However, despite its size, many Red Army units were poorly organized and poorly led due to the great officer purges of the 30s. Even in face of token resistance, the Soviet advance was often slow and rather chaotic. Still, there was little the Poles could do to stop them, as the mismatch between the two opposing forces was absurd. With the majority of available Polish forces in the area being battered army units staggering back from the Germans, or lightly armed border guards. Indeed, so great was the disparity that the Soviets fielded around one army corps for every Polish battalion. This effectively ended any remaining chance of creating a fallback defensive line behind the Vistula in eastern Poland. Once it became clear that their country was going to be conquered by these two larger hostile powers, Marshal Edward Ridge Migwe ordered his soldiers to retreat into Romania and not fire unless fired upon. Nevertheless, there was sporadic fighting against the Soviets, and despite the absurd mismatch, Polish resistance to this new invader was surprisingly staunch and capable. At Vilno, the Polish garrison put up a fight at first, but was not really well prepared or equipped, lacking heavy artillery or significant anti-tank weaponry. The Poles resisted as long as they could, but were eventually simply overwhelmed by thousands of Red Army soldiers and hundreds of tanks. Afterwards, many of the survivors then fled for neutral Lithuania. At Grodno, Polish resistance was stronger and better organized. The first Soviet at attacks came to grief against well-prepared defenses. Many of the defenders fought with near suicidal bravery, as evidenced by Polish fighters, including teenage volunteers, attacking Soviet tanks with petrol bombs. In many places, German soldiers had already advanced into areas designated as Soviet occupation zones, and the front line, to the extent it existed at all, was chaotic and incredibly confused, as armies of three countries took part in the maelstrom. 
At times, German and Soviet troops fired at each other, but for the most part, the two invaders tried to show each other deference. Indeed, at one point, the now famous German general Heinz Guderian and veteran Soviet armored brigade commander Simeon Kryvershin, who had commanded during the Spanish Civil War, met in a formal ceremony handing over the city of Brest to the Soviets. Though the Soviet intervention was not the end of the war by any means, as ferocious fighting continued on for more than two weeks, any Polish hope of establishing a new position in the east was now dashed, as surviving holdouts were reduced, and the most they could do was simply evacuate as many soldiers as possible to fight another day. Supported by available tanks, Army Krakow made a ferocious breakout attempt through German lines, but was ultimately unsuccessful, and finally surrendered on the 20th. A day later, the last remnants of the Bezira pocket were finally destroyed, freeing more German units to be used against Warsaw. Also on this day, the Soviets finally succeeded in overrunning the last Polish defenders of Grodno. German attacks against Warsaw eventually continued, but Polish forces around their capital were still strong, and these attacks initially made little progress against well-prepared Polish defenses, as both sides suffered significant losses. The Germans had been slow to institute a tight envelopment of the city, allowing retreating Polish soldiers to continue slipping through into Warsaw. Despite the overall hopelessness of the situation, Polish defenses at Warsaw and nearby Modlin were significant, and determined to continue the fight. The Germans decided that Warsaw would be reduced with methods other than direct assault, namely heavy artillery and aerial bombardment. Not wanting to waste his army in more bloody street fighting, Hitler predicted that preventing civilians from evacuating would cause food shortages and force the city to surrender. He claimed, Warsaw will not be taken by assault. None of my soldiers will fall. The Luftwaffe and artillery will destroy all subsistence and services. In three or four days, Warsaw will capitulate. On the 25th, there was another massive Luftwaffe bombing of Warsaw, which set numerous fires throughout the city and inflicted heavy civilian casualties. This was known as Black Monday. Further German assaults in the 26th managed to take several outlying forts before they became bogged down in hard street-to-street -street fighting. Still, it was clear that the Poles were at the end of the rope. Indeed, Hitler's prediction soon proved correct. Despite the fact that a sizable garrison remained, Warsaw was by then under constant bombardment and with no real hope of relief, finally had to surrender on the 27th. By this point, much of the city had been destroyed or severely damaged and a large portion of the civilian population killed. When the nearby fortress city of Modlin surrendered as well, this effectively ended Polish resistance in the vicinity of their capital. In the aftermath, German SS units executed many surrendered Polish soldiers and casually murdered Polish civilians as they sacked the city, giving an ugly preview of much of what was to come. By this point, only a handful of scattered Polish holdouts remained. On October 2nd, Polish defenders of the Baltic Sea coast on the Hell Peninsula garrison finally surrendered. Surprisingly, these units had held out despite being nearly completely isolated since the beginning of the conflict. Ultimately, it meant little to the overall progression of the campaign, but showed the Polish determination to fight even against overwhelming odds. On the 6th of October, an improvised but still potent Polish battle group under General Francis Kleberg tried to fight its way to Warsaw, not knowing that the city had already fallen. After a ferocious fight against the Germans, Kleberg too surrendered to Kork, and this represented the capitulation of the last significant Polish force in the field. Although underground Polish resistance would continue, the state of Poland had fallen, and this would have wide-reaching re consequences. The carcass of the Polish state was now carved up by its butchers, and the territories of Poland were partitioned between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. The western German portion was divided between areas annexed directly to the Reich and those of the general government, 
In the east, the Soviet occupied region was divided between Belarusian and Ukrainian SSRs. In addition, the area around Vilno was annexed by Lithuania. The invasion of Poland was Nazi Germany's first military victory. Previous successes such as the Rhineland, Austria, and Czechoslovakia were all essentially diplomatic. It was in Poland that German military strength was proven. Indeed, the world was stunned by how quickly the German army had succeeded in its invasion. But the course of the battle had not gone seamlessly by any means either. The much vaunted panzer divisions, for the many successes, showed weaknesses when tasked with attacking prepared Polish defenses, as evidenced by difficulties at places such as Makra, Mawawa, and Warsaw. Similarly, the vast majority of German panzers were quite vulnerable to modern anti-tank weapons. Likewise, the Luftwaffe had played a great role in the campaign that suffered relatively heavy losses against a much weaker opponent. Similarly, the ground strikes by German planes undoubtedly played a very great role. They were mainly used to attack pre-selected targets behind enemy lines, rather than being used for close air support on the request of the army. Germany had gained a massive amount of experience from this campaign, which they would definitely need if they were to have any chance taking on a first-tier military power like France. Despite claims to the contrary, which persist to this day, there can be no doubt that the Soviet Union participated in the invasion, partition, and occupation of Poland alongside Nazi Germany. Even with the massive numerical superiority they enjoyed, the Red Army did not perform very well, suffering surprisingly high losses for the nature of the campaign. In addition, many lost vehicles were due to mechanical breakdown or accidents, rather than enemy action. For many communists around the world, it would be difficult to reconcile seeing the USSR as a champion of anti-imperialism and anti-fascism when it directly cooperated with an overtly fascist government to conquer its smaller neighbor. For Poland, the September campaign was an unmitigated disaster, which saw the end of their country's independence as an autonomous state, as it was divided and partitioned by two much larger powers. From a military perspective, Polish soldiers had generally given a good account of themselves when fighting from prepared positions, but were unable to establish a continuous front line from the beginning, allowing the superior German forces to break through in many places and push on without the Poles being able to seriously stop them. A darker side to this conflict was the ordeal which the Polish civilian population went through at the hands of the occupying Germans as well as the Soviets. During the course of the campaign, German soldiers, especially SS units, but also regular army forces, indiscriminately murdered many Poles and Jews. It was so heinous that some German generals, such as Blaskowitz, even complained about the SS units' behavior, citing how they were more concerned with abusing civilians and looting than actually fighting. The population of annexed Poland, Jews and Gentile Poles alike, were treated as an inferior people. Many Poles were driven off their lands to make way for German settlers, while others were used as slave labor in Nazi Germany. This would eventually culminate in the nightmarish death camps, now known as Auschwitz, Treblinka, and others. Likewise, the area of Poland annexed by the Soviet Union became subject to the iron fist of Stalinist rule, whereas Nazi treatment of the Polish population was often in theory based on ideas of race and ethnicity Soviet policies were enacted in the name of class. Just as the Nazi leadership saw the Poles as an inferior racial type, Soviet authorities saw the Poles as feudal capitalist oppressors. One saying went, once a Pole, always a Kulak, showing how Poles were identified as reactionary exploiters of the peasantry. Just like the Germans, the Soviets conducted numerous atrocities in their occupation zone. For instance, the infamous Katyn Massacre, in which numerous Polish officers were killed in the Katyn Forest, an event that was later blamed on the Germans in the official Soviet narrative. In addition, countless Poles were deported to Siberia and used as slave labor, many of whom would never see their homeland again. The only real silver lining, however slight, 
to the situation was that many Polish soldiers were able to escape out of the country, eventually making their way to France and Britain, and would continue to fight even after the country had been conquered. Despite their assurances to Poland, Britain and France were largely inactive during the month-long war. Indeed, in Britain, during a session at Parliament, when it was suggested that Germany could be bombed, the retort was that such an action would risk destroying private property. While the French invasion of the Rhineland was never seriously intended to become a full-fledged offensive, actually capable of diverting Germany's strength. However, less than a year later, Britain and France would find themselves face-to-face -face with the German army, now battle-hardened from his experiences in Poland.